head over to miniaturemarket.com where they have thousands of board games at discounted prices like the Search for Planet X. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today, we're going to be looking up to the visible sky, trying to survey different sectors of the sky. We're going to be looking for asteroids and comets and dwarf planets, you name it. But what we're really searching for is Planet X. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the Search for Planet X. It's a logic and deduction game for two to four players brought to us by Renegade Game Studios and Foxtrot Games. Let me show you how it's played. I'll see you on the other side. The object of the game is to be the one with the most points in the end. And you'll be getting points by finding Planet X. Finding it first will get you the most points, but other players will get points for it too if they can find it later. You'll also get points for being the first to submit any correct theories, and you'll be getting points for submitting correct theories on the different types of objects. Now speaking of those objects, you'll see them over here. We have comets, asteroids, dwarf planets, gas clouds, planet X, and some empty sectors. It also shows you how many objects there are in each of these. Two comets, four asteroids, one dwarf planet, two gas clouds, one planet X, and two truly empty sectors. It also has specific logic rules that have to do with all these. For example, comets are only in per uh, particular sectors. And if you look on your uh, map here of the different sectors, it actually shows that comets are only possible in these specific sectors. And for example, the four asteroids are adjacent to at least one other. So each asteroid is adjacent to at least one other one. Dwarf planets are never adjacent to the planet X. In this case, there's only one of them because we're playing the standard mode. The two gas clouds, they're adjacent to at least one truly empty sector. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Planet X is not adjacent to a dwarf planet but it appears empty. As we're doing actions and looking for things, empty things might actually be Planet X. And that's why we say truly empty sectors. Uh, there's two of them, but Planet X will appear empty. Those are some of the basic logic rules there in every game. Now these research and conference notes are going to give you some new logic rules that will apply only to this specific game. Now each sector has one of each of those objects and over the course of the game you're trying to basically deduce and rule out what isn't there using these logic rules and the ones that you learn through research and conference notes trying to deduce where planet X is, also where some of the other objects are and make uh, correct theories about those. The game is played over multiple turns, and turns are not taken necessarily in any specific order. They're taken in the order of where your player pawns are on the board. For example, we're all in the same sector here. Whoever's the furthest back will take the first turn. They'll end up moving forward to a different sector. Then it will be the yellow player's turn, then red, then blue. So it's always whoever's the furthest back, it will be their turn. So when it's your turn, you have one of four options. You can survey, target, research, or locate Planet X. Survey is a thing that will happen most often in the game, so let's start with that one. Tap Survey. Now here it's going to ask you what you're surveying for, and it's going to ask you how many sectors you're surveying for. Now you can only survey sectors that are in the visible sky. The visible sky are the sectors that you can see here. It's always going to be half the board. So sectors 1 through 6 is what this starts with. And as you can see, the other numbers are you know, covered up by the earth wheel here. So sectors 1 through 6 is where you can survey. So let's say I wanted to survey for comets. Now at the top it tells you how much time it's going to take. Uh, so one, two, or three sectors is going to take four time. Four, five, or six is going to be three time. Now in this case, I'm going to survey for comets. So I'll select the comet picture. And I'm going to say I'm going to start in sector two. And I'm going to end in sector five. Now these sectors are only ones that contain comets. And so I will say survey. It tells you how much time it's going to take. In this case, three. So I will go ahead and click that. And it says, first of all, we're going to advance the player pawn three time, and there is one comet in sectors two through five. Now it's important to note that you're the only one looking at this app at this point in time and getting the answer, and you're not mentioning the answer to anybody, it's secret for you. Now moving three time means you're going to move three sectors, just like that. Now, if there happened to have been another player there, when you get there, you'll move all the way to the front in front of all of those players. That means that the players behind you are going to be able to go before you. So we would then write what we did under our action. We surveyed, so we did comets, C, sectors two through five, and we know that there is one of them. 
However, let's say it's our next turn and we want to target. Remember, you were given two of these target tokens. You can only use them twice throughout the game. We would spend one of these. I would go you know, back to the box. Now keep in mind, targeting a sector only is available in the sectors that are in the visible sky. So in this case, in the app, we're gonna tap target and we're going to select which sector. Essentially, you're going to be able to see exactly what is in one sector. In this case, we select sector three and target shows you you're gonna be moving four time. Targeting always does that. We'll go here. Now, again, it tells you to advance your player upon four and there is a comet in sector three. So we'd make a note again, we targeted sector three, it is a comet. And so we know that this comet is in sector three is correct. So what I've done is I've circled the comet in sector three, which means that there's nothing else in that sector because there's always just one specific thing in any sector. Now remember earlier, we knew that there was one comet within sectors two through five. And since we found this, we made our little note here that these were linked and only one of them were it. Not only could we deduce that nothing else was in here, but we also was able to cross off the other two comets, which means there's only one comet left because we found one of the two here and one of the other two comets are right there. So in our next turn, maybe we wanna research and we wanna learn more about comets and we could either look at asteroids and comets or we could look at gas clouds and comets here. Now we've got some information on some gas clouds at the beginning, so let's do this. Let's do research E. Now again, it would be somebody else's turn now, but we're just kind of showing you what research is like. So we're gonna select research, which is only one time, and we are going to do gas clouds and comets D. Again, we'd advance our player upon one. It says every gas cloud is directly opposite a comet. Now, as a reminder, you must choose a different action on your next turn. You cannot take the research action twice in a row. And so I wrote that information here. I said, every gas cloud is directly opposite a comet. So we come over here, we knew this was a comet. So like, we know that there's a gas cloud directly opposite from that sector. So we circled this and we ruled out all that other information. And since we know the other comet has to be here or here, that means the only other gas cloud has to be di directly opposite from here or directly opposite from here. So I've crossed out in places that can't be, and I linked those other twos together again, saying only one of these things is true, but I linked it with a B because I already used A, I just go sort of in, in order there. So let's talk about rotating the earth board. Remember, you take a turn, you move your pawn, and then possibly move this board. If the sector that is right next to it is empty, meaning there's no pawns up here, you'll slide it over to the next one, and you'll look again. If this is empty, you'll slide it here, and now there is a pawn here, so we'll stop. It's now going to be the blue player's turn. However, let's say the blue player was further ahead. We would spin it again. Now we see this icon. Anytime this comes in contact with this icon, there is time to uh, submit a theory. In the theory phase, players are gonna decide whether they wanna submit one of their theories or not. In this standard mode, you'll be selecting zero or one. All players will put their hand down outside of their shield and at the same time, once everyone has it, they will reveal either zero or one. You do zero to bluff and, sh and you know, throw people off whether you're submitting a theory or not. Now, starting with the player whose pawn is the furthest back, meaning they're gonna have the next turn, if they submitted a theory, they will place it. Now, it's always face down and they will place it in the furthest spot out. It has a little plus sign. So let's say like this. Now, keep in mind, submitting theories, these sectors do not have to be in the visible sky. Then the next player, let's say yellow did it. Now, if it's in the same theory phase, which it is now, and during this theory submission, if they wanted to, they could also go in the same spot, always face down. You'll do this for all players. Once all players have done this, you'll move all theories one spot closer to the center. Now in this case, we have no theories that have made it all the way to the center, so we'll just simply go to the next player's turn, which in this case will be purple because they're the furthest back. So let's pretend we were a few theory phases in the future and the theory phase, everyone just placed their submittals and everything's getting moved to the middle. So these would move down and these would move down. And again, starting with sector one and moving all the way through 12, if any of these have made it all the way to the center, you're going to do a peer review. The first thing you'll do in each of these sectors that has at least one theory here is you'll reveal those theories. If there's more than one in the same spot, you will reveal both of them. You do not reveal any theories further back in the chain. Now remember, sector three was the one that we found the comet in. The other player thought it was an asteroid. Let's see how this works. So in the app, we're going to select peer review there down towards the bottom. 
we're then going to select a sector. Here we're looking for sector three, and we're gonna say the object. In this case, let's first select the comet. So we'll go here, and we'll say view result. And it says, correct, sector three has a comet. Now, since everyone knows it's correct, they can make notes on their note sheet knowing that that now has a comet in it. Now, correct ones will stay right in the spot. They're gonna give them points at the end of the game. Incorrect ones will get removed from the game. They don't get given back to the player. Now, the player who had an incorrect theory must move one spot forward on the time track as a penalty. Now, we look back in the chain if any of these are face down. Since we got a correct one, the rest of these will get turned face up to see if they're also correct. This one is too, so it will stay right here. And this is important to know that they stay like this because whoever got there first is going to get some additional points at the end of the game, as you'll see. After any sector has a correct theory, no other theories may be placed here for the rest of the game. Now, as the game continues and the Earth board rotates, you might end up coming to this X1. This is a conference. And again, we're moving up here because this is the last player here, and it's going to have a conference. Now, the last possible thing you could do on your turn is locate Planet X. And as you can see there on the app, it's the last of the four normal actions up top. We will select that. Now, it's not just good enough to select Planet X themselves. Let's just say we say eight. You also have to select what is adjacent to it on both sides. So Planet X is Sector 8. We will say, let's say, uh, Asteroid is in 7, and we will say Truly Empty is in Sector 9. And we'd say Locate Planet X. We would then move our uh, Pawn 5, as it shows you there, and it's either going to say Correct or Incorrect. So it says you did not locate Planet X. It doesn't tell you what you've gotten right, but it does say at least one piece of information you entered is correct. And again, don't forget to move your pawn five spots on the time track. And keep in mind, locating Planet X, that specific sector does not have to be in the visible sky to do this. Now, if you have located Planet X, you will still advance your player pawn five spots on the time track, and it will tell you that you found Planet X. Do not tell anybody where it is or what you found. Now, this will trigger the end of the game now the other players don't take any normal turns and any players that are further back, let's say we were the ones that figured it out, anyone further back has a couple of options. Anyone ahead of us does nothing. This player also wouldn't be able to do anything at the game's end if they were in the same sector as the one that found Planet X. Your player shield helps with this, but each of those players that are behind can either locate Planet X or they can submit one or two theories. And this depends on how far back they are. Then players will tally up their score. They'll get one point for every sector that they were the first to submit a correct theory, as I just showed. Then they'll get a certain amount of points for each object that they correctly submitted a theory for. In this case, comets are worth three points for each correct theory in different sectors. I had two of those, so I have six points. Same for the gas clouds. I had two different theories that were correct, so I got a total of four twice, which is eight points. I got the dwarf planet right, and I was the first to get planet X, so I have a total of 30 points. If it's tied at this point, the one who scored the most points for locating Planet X would be the winner. If it's still tied, the player who scored the most points for the leader bonuses of being the first ones to submit theories wins. And if it's still tied, you rejoice in your shared victory. All right, first thing I like about this game, it is a pure logic and deduction game. You've got your notepad, you've got clues, you're trying to figure things out and puzzle it out. Uh, my deduction is one of, if not my favorite style of game. And uh, I like my deduction games to be pure logic and deduction games. I don't like a lot of other Chrome and other mechanisms built in around deduction. I typically like it very pure, and this game is as, as pure as it gets. Uh, every game, not only are there specific logic rules that pertain to the certain things, like comets and, and asteroids, you know, they're, they're at least one asteroid next to another, things like that. There's certain logic that is the same every game. But the cool thing is, is every game also has different logic programmed into it, thanks to the app. So every game is different. You're like, okay, I've got this base set of logic that I know and I get better at understanding as I play. But then every game, there's some twists where it's like, oh, this game, uh, the dwarf planet is not directly opposite any comets. And you're like, oh, okay, that's cool. But next game, that research might be different. And even the types of researches that are out there, meaning what relates with what is different. That is just mind boggling and amazing. This game has like unlimited replayability because of this. Every time you play it, there's gonna be a familiarity to it, but there's also gonna be sort of this new thing anytime you take the research action. And that is just, I've never seen anything like this in a deduction game. I think it's one of the best parts of this game because it will never get old. Chain 
completing the puzzle every single game. Uh, I like that you're trying to also find the right time to survey a specific area of the visible sky. And it's like, oh, I really need to look at sectors three through five, but you know what, next turn, we're in a season that I won't be able to see it. So I gotta think, what else should I do? What other sectors over here am I gonna dissect? And then later on, maybe after that time, it will spin enough that I'll be able to do that. And it, it keeps it, gives it one more aspect to the challenge of trying to figure out what order to do things in, what's gonna be coming up and things like that. I like that aspect of it. I like that you're dis, uh, deducing where things are based on what others are doing and their theories. Cause you're writing down what other players are looking for. Next player next to you goes, hey, I'm, the, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna survey sectors uh, three through six for asteroids. And you're like, okay, write that down. But then in the theory phase, you see in sector five, they play something you're like, okay, I'm going to make a note that's like, that is probably an asteroid. If I don't know one way or another, if it is or it's not, I'm just going to pretend it is and make a note and that will allow me to deduce things. So maybe next time, if you don't have a good theory, you can double up on that and just guess and possibly piggyback on them. It's such a really cool thing. They may or may not be right. They may be bluffing, who knows, but the aspect that you're learning things from what other players are asking. Now in many other games, like sleuth and things like that you can kind of learn things by what people are asking but in this way it's a lot more direct and it, it just it, it's it's a lot more distilled and i like that aspect of it scoring the points is really cool because you're getting points for not only correct theories but also being first for doing so so like in the last example you might say well that stinks that someone can get it and then you can just kind of deduce it and 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 get points with them yes but they're going to get one more point from you because they did it first and this game sometimes does come down to a point or two so that really evens that out and it's a brilliant idea to make that happen. You don't have to be the first or to find Planet X to win. A lot of these deduction games, it's a race, right? This is not because if someone finds Planet X, other players still get one last thing to either also solve for Planet X or, so, or put one or two theories in. So you can actually find Planet X second or third or fourth, doesn't matter, depending on how far back you are, and you might still win if you played the rest of the game good, meaning you're getting theories from other, you're scoring a lot of theories and things like that. I think it's brilliant. You know, there was a deduction game back in the day called um, uh, the, the, the Mystery of the Abbey, and one of the things you could do is go and make a declaration is, you know, the person who was the killer was bearded, you know, and it's out loud and stuff like that. But there's a lot of articles about how that was sort of a broken way and you could, you could sort of game the game. You can't hear. Like, if you don't do theories because you don't want to give other players information, but you find Planet X, if the other players find Planet X too, most likely you're not going to win uh, if you don't do any theories. So it, like, makes you have to be involved, which gives other players information, which keeps the game going. It's just brilliant that you don't have to be the first to find Planet X to win. I love that. Uh, you cannot get a wrong answer. This is another big thing. Problems with deduction games is no matter how hard you try, sometimes you might, by accident, give somebody a wrong answer to their question. And if that happens, you've pretty much ruined their entire game. They're gonna play an hour game, and at the end, they're not gonna get it. They're gonna come back and go, oh yeah, well, I asked for this, you said this, that's not true, oh, I'm sorry. Here, you can't do that. The app is giving you the answer. So if you get it wrong, it's your own problem for not like looking at the answer and writing it down. I mean, so you literally cannot get a wrong answer for someone else. That's awesome. It fixes all those problems in deduction games. I like that you can play at different levels of difficulty in the same game. So if you're an adult, very experienced, you're playing as a child, the child can play youth and you can play experience. And then you're at like even levels. That is brilliant. I love that, that you can do this. Oof, it's, this game is a stacking thing after thing after thing that are breakthroughs in this area. Also expert mode, wow. If even beginner mode on experienced or when you're getting no clues on beginner mode is hard enough. Expert mode, wow, forget about it. It's total brain burner. 18 sectors, tons of them. And then some of the things interact differently with each other, like the asteroids. Uh, glad it's there, but I don't think I'll need it too much. Uh, the game works great with two players. Not a lot of deduction games, pure logic deduction games, work well with two players. There's a few of them out there, not a whole lot. Huge plus that it works with two, but even more, this game works with a solo mode. It has a bot. And I know that most of the times I don't like playing against bots, but here, because the app is running, the bot works great. The bot actually learns from your theories of what you're putting in there. And app peer review, when it comes up and it shows it, the bot actually learns that information and changes what it does. It's literally like you're playing against a second player. It really is. It's, you get to learn what they're searching for. You get to learn if they're throwing down theories. Like it's literally playing a two player game solo. I don't know of any, there might be one, but I don't know of any other pure logic deduction games that have a solo mode that literally is not like playing a different game, but you're literally playing the same game 
solo. This game, that, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I've never seen this before and it excites me so much. Um, on the negative side, there's a lot of going on. There's a lot to think about. And if you're playing with players that have analysis paralysis, they might hold the game up quite a bit as they're thinking about theories and thinking about this, and they might hold the game up. It can happen, but there's a lot going on. So that's my only negative. This game's unbelievable. Um, up until this point, it used to be Sleuth was my favorite deduction game of all time. Uh, and that held water for a long time. That game came out like 1970 something, 73, 70, something like that. Um, then a couple years ago, Cryptid came out and that overthrew uh, Sleuth is my favorite deduction game, but I gotta say because of all the reasons I just mentioned here This is now my new favorite deduction game of all time and deduction games are my favorite games This is super high it doesn't get much higher than this So for that it's gonna be getting a saxophone serenade because it's absolutely staying in my gaming library So let's hit it Did you miss the Game Topper 2.0 Kickstarter? Have no fear, it's not too late to get in on the ultimate gaming accessory. Convert your table into a high quality gaming table with a fully portable Game Topper system and take advantage of some of the best three millimeter premium gaming mats in the industry. New styles, new sizes, and new accessories can be yours. Upgrade every game you play by late backing now at GameToppersLLC.com.